President Adam Abaro begins his annual nationwide Meet the People tour under the team. Together we can accelerate socio-economic growth and maintain peace and stability. COP27 wraps up on Sunday with a deal to create a fund to help poor countries being battered by climate change disasters. And Ebola trial vaccines are expected in Uganda to help overcome the spreading disease in the country. This and more coming your way on The World Today. Hello, this is Africa TV and you are watching the World Today News Bulletin. Coming to you live from our studios in Banjul. Many thanks for joining us. I am Amadou Kante and now the news in detail. And we begin with the presidency because the Gambian leader, President Adam Abaro, on Monday commenced his three weeks long Meet the People tour, a yearly occurrence during which the head of state visited key projects, sites and also listened to what the people have to say about various issues affecting their lives. President Barrow is scheduled to visit projects in the North Bank region, notably the Nyomi Hakaland Road and hold a general meeting in Ndungu Kebe that would be attended by communities from the two Nyomi districts as well as Jokando for a start. Mavo Jisese has more of that in this report. It is the constitutional mandate of the Gambian leader to embark on a nationwide tour once or twice a year so as to meet and discuss with citizens and have first-hand information on their plights and aspirations. The timing and duration of the tour is usually at the president's choosing as well as where to hold meetings. But the choice of November for the tour is seen as a smart decision given that the groundnut season is on and farmers cherish the opportunity to engage the head of state and lobby for good prices for their nuts. The three-week tour will take the president to all regions in the country. He is expected to hold meetings in Badibu Gunjur, Maka Farafenye, Njau, Lamengkoto, Chamoy, Mankamankunda, Kuli Bantang, Jareng, Bansang, Japine, Kiwinala, Sibanor, Brikama, Maninaring, Tujereng, Talinding, and Banjul. Mafuji I Africa News. We'll bring you more details of the president's tour in our subsequent news edition as he begins a two-week nationwide or countrywide tour. Now, moving on, after several days of intense negotiations that uh, stretch into the early Sunday morning in Sam al Seh, Egypt, a representative of nearly 200 parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change pledged to establish a loss and damage fund to compensate vulnerable nations for climate change induced disasters. Maria Macham has more details of that in this report. Creating a specific fund for loss and damage marked an important point of progress with the issue added to the official agenda and adopted for the first time at COP27. Governments took the groundbreaking decision to establish new funding arrangements as well as dedicated funds to assist developing countries in responding to loss and damage. Governments also agreed to establish a transitional committee to make recommendations on how to operationalize both the new funding agreements and the fund at COP28 next year. The first meeting of the Transitional Committee is expected to take place before the end of March 2023. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Executive Secretary Simon Steele said a decade-long conversation has been addressed by creating funding for damage and loss of climate regarding the text adopted on Sunday morning. We've determined a way forward on a decade-long conversation on funding for loss and damage deliberating over how we address the impacts on communities whose lives and livelihoods have been ruined by the very worst impacts of climate change. So at COP27, we've established the fund that will provide one pillar of the response required to ensure loss and damage is addressed. 
Without the voices of individuals, whether they're activists, researchers, scientists, youth, or indigenous peoples, we would not have gotten this far. Set against a difficult geopolitical backdrop, COP27 resulted in countries delivering a package of decisions that reaffirmed their commitment to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The package also strengthened action by countries to cut greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to the inevitable impacts of climate change, as well as boosting the support of finance, technology and capacity building needed by developing countries. The two-week summit, which was scheduled to end Friday, went into overtime Saturday as negotiators from nearly 200 nations clashed over critical issues. Reporting for iAfrican News, I am Maria Macham. COP27 ends yesterday uh, in Egypt, and of course, um, I know many would now look forward to what will be the uh, how soon with the developed nations will respond to the pledge they have made. Now, moving on, the, of course, three PhD students from Nigeria's Ahmadou Bello University have unveiled the outcome of a research on the production of a new low-cost water filtration device for the removal of toxic heavy metals from portable water. This development was shared at the recent 8 Africa Higher Education Center of Excellence for Development Impact, ACE Impact Regional Meeting held here in Banjul. And as Moses E. Mende reports, the intervention has the potential to drastically alter water poultry or purity levels in remote areas of the continent. Access to portable water still remains a huge challenge for many people on the African continent. Poor sanitation and hygiene causes pathogens to contaminate surface and groundwater bodies, thus making these communities susceptible to waterborne diseases. Three PhD students, Iju Juliana Omonya, Odili Cynthia Uju, and Uzo Choku Merian Ifioma of the Amadou Bello University in Nigeria worked together on the research that looks into a new low-cost water filtration device for removal of toxic heavy metals and pathogens. Here is Juliana Omonia sharing the outcome of their research work. We discovered that in developing countries, water, portable water is a challenge. Most people do not have access to portable water. And where there is portable water, they do not have enough of portable water. That is, it's, it's not really enough in quantity. And that's why there's a need to find a means to purify wastewater for people to get more water for usage. And in this case, we discovered that several methods have been adopted and proposed for treatment of wastewater, but some of them have some drawbacks. So from our little research, we discovered that membrane filtration is a good approach to purifying wastewater, but this membrane is expensive. So in order to reduce cost of this membrane, we decided to come up with something using natural products, inexpensive kaolin. That's what we used here. And HAP, that is hydrosy appetite, gotten from bones, cow bones. The research consisted of key novelties and Marian Ifioma breaks down the novelties. The key novelties in this work are the materials we used. The materials are available they are environmentally friendly. Like she told you, the kaolin base, like we have a huge deposit of kaolin, kankara kaolin in Nigeria. The, the hydrogen appetite was actually gotten from was a waste material, animal bones that were used for nothing. So we're trying to do a waste to wealth initiative. Okay, again, this project is also sustainable because the materials are available. We, the, the filter produced can also be reused. And so for a long time, you can be able to use this material. Another thing again is the, for the first time, we're using a, a transitional pedagogy to, to teach engineering students how to treat water, how to do simulation, and how to also test material integrity using our, our new Kapla we develop at the center. This, the center owns this technology. It is unique to us. So this is another kind of innovation that comes with this 
work. The ACE Impact Project Development objective is to improve the quality, quantity, and development impact of postgraduate education in selected universities through regional specialization and collaboration. Odile Cynthia Uju explains that the project has improved the learning experience of its beneficiaries. The ACE Impact Project has been very impactful to me and to not just my colleagues, to most of the students at the African Center of Excellence on New Pedagogies and Engineering Education. And one of the impacts is it has improved our learning experience. So instead of the normal traditional lectures, we've had other lectures like virtual learning, um, we've done internships, and then our overall learning experience has really been improved. The first phase of ACE Impact was launched in 2014, with 22 centers of excellence in nine West and Central African countries, aiming at building the capacity of higher education institutions in Africa. After registering successes in the first phase of the ACE Impact project, the World Bank and the French Development Agency, in collaboration with African governments, launched the second phase of the project in 2018 to strengthen postgraduate training and applied research in existing fields and support new fields that are essential to Africa's economic growth. Reporting for iAfrica News, I am Moses Imendi. Congratulations to the three Nigerian students and I hope they will serve as an inspiration not only to students from Nigeria but here too in the Gambia. Now, let's stay with matters in the country, though, because reports are surfacing of the death of a Gambian teenager, Yankuba Jaju of Gifanga, who was allegedly shot and killed by Senegalese soldiers at the border village of uh, Jibijar on Sunday while out with colleagues to collect firewood. Now, the spokesman of the Gambia Armed Forces, when, contact, when contacted to set light on the issue, told iAfrica TV that a military patrol team has been sent to the scene from Kanilai to gather information on the incident. Mafuji Sisi takes a look at this latest shooting incident and a latany of others on Gambian blamed on Senegalese security forces. Here's more of that in this report. This is Yakuba Jaju, allegedly shot and killed on Sunday by Senegalese soldiers in Jibijor, a border village in the Kasamas. Yankuba and his colleagues were said to have gone to the forest to collect firewood, just as people in that border area have done for as long as anyone can remember. According to an eyewitness account, once the lads were in the forest, they scattered, but then all of a sudden, they sighted a drone and then the sound of a gunfire. The death of Yakuba Jaju, if confirmed to have been the work of Senegalese soldiers, will likely spark new calls by Gambians for their immediate withdrawal. They have been implicated in several killings and human rights abuses since their deployment into the country in 2017. First, it was Haruna Jata who got shot and killed by Senegalese soldiers in Kanilai. Way back in 2017, in 2021, one Omar Njai of Sare Omar village in the URR was shot in the leg by Senegalese forestry officers who presently crossed into the Gambian territory on motorcycles. There is also the audacious shooting of Suleiman Trawale of Kantora by Senegalese security forces on the allegations of endangering wildlife. He was subsequently taken over to Senegal and was only repatriated after a strong stance taken by Nam for Kantora, Bileji Tunkara, for his release. It has become the norm in recent years for Senegalese security personnel deployed here in the Gambia to use brute force against Gambian civilians, especially on natives of Fonyi. Crossing the border in pursuit of illegal loggers is also becoming a pastime for Senegalese forestry officials. The sense of impunity they exhibit on Gambian soil is despicable and there is need to put a stop to this. Mafuji Sise, iAfrica News. And you are watching the World Today News Bulletin on Africa TV coming to you live from our studios in Banjul. And from that report there by Mafuji Sise, we now take a break and come back shortly. Stay with us, we'll be right back. South Africa Global, New Ninjaka Sancha Eco Smart City Fisi Gambia, the tough city, the Kawaii, Nugidigante Gunjur Aksifo, 
fan weer minute rek la la jël nga ag sa bandul international airport ba chat of city di nga dikanu la nexé ligey ka ya nga fa be bu foyé kay pour sen jobot amna fa nduge ka yu wer mbolem lu askan bi soxla ci dekk way ak dekkin bu baax rafette yomba mu nga chat of city xayma nañ fa juroomi june kir ci juroom témeri hectare la ñu wara sampa yu nit mëna jënda taf city dina op bandul ñaari yoon dekk way ja rafette na yomba na té juroom fukki nit di ñëk jënda dinañ lañ wañul 20% set sil taf tay am sa dekk way tay jokkol ak ñom ci plus 220 wala plus 220 376 233 wala nga jokkol ak ñom info at tafafricaglobal.com wala nga setti len ci sen office ba samadi ba mall bu food gardens estate taf africa global bunti wer gu yaram gi ministry of health ñoy xamle ne febar bi japp ndombel ñu nan ko acute kidney injury mo feñ ci xalé ci biir rew mi febar bi jangoro bu bon la te faatna xalé yu bari ci biir rew mi man nar nga febar bi bokka na ci bi bu daw wuccu ñak saw ba di seben lu ndaw baken buy sauté ku saxat yaram bu tang xama nga ñu lan mo waral man nar nga yi ci xalé li wor moy gis nañu ay jumtuway ci biir garab bi ndox pour xalé yi li tax mu télé ak yeneeni jangoro yu ñu wor ci suñu dekkuway né yi mu na waral fébari dombel bi ñu naan acute kidney injury ba AKI buntu wër gu yaram gi ñu ngi ñaax képp kuy yaay ba nga yoré ay xalé sa yu xalé bi fébari nang ko yobbu ci béré bu fajé kay bu la gëna jégé té moy tandiku di facc xalé yi ñom ci séni bop ñu déllu di ñaax askan bi pour ñu wëyal ak saxal li nga xamné moy set yeen wajuri ak ñi topato xalé yi ñu ngi leen di ñaax bu leen jox xalé yi garab bi ndox bi nga xamné wa made in pharmaceutical limited ñoko liggé garab yoyu ñoy promethazine oral suspension bp cofex maline baby cough syrup ma cough baby cough syrup ak lu ñu naan ma grip and cold syrups ngir am ay xibaar yu wor ci febar bi mu ngi na wote ci number bi di 1025 wa buntu wer gu yaram gi ak fan na bi yore walun seytu garab medical control agency ci kon dimbal bu ñu jot baye ko who ñoo len indil xibaar bi Under the auspices of the President, His Excellency Adam Abaro, the Muslim World League, in collaboration with the Gambia government, will host the Conference of African Religious Ministers and Ulamas on the 6th of December, 2022. The International Islamic Conference will bring together ministers of religious affairs, leading Islamic scholars, policymakers, youths, community leaders across Africa to discuss and advance Islamic values that promote peace and tolerance. Let's come together and welcome our brothers and sisters in keeping with our trademark hospitality. at the smiling coast of Africa. This message is brought to you by the Ministry responsible for religious affairs in collaboration with the Gambia OIC Secretariat. Welcome back. This is Africa TV from The Gambia, and you are watching the World Today News Bulletin. Once again, many thanks for joining us, and let's now look at the rest of the stories. Now, to uh, some sad news somehow, because Pandere Mbai was a Gambian journalist who died in the U.S. on the 22nd November 2021, before his relocation to the U.S. in 2005, where he set up the online news website, Freedom Newspaper, He had been extensively involved in the Gambian media for well over a decade, working for both the Point newspaper and the defunct Daily Observer. His reporting on issues back home in the Gambia uh, earned him a huge following at the time when dissent was not tolerated. In the same measure, he was also uh, despised on many, who, of course, on many who see him as a uh, despot. Well, I beg your pardon, uh, as a disparaging agent of the worst 
bent on the painting the country in a negative light. Maria Machams looks back at his life of a man who was highly polarizing. In the eyes of many Gambians, Pandya Rimbai was a brilliant and fearless journalist who championed the cause of press freedom and democracy. His highly read online publication, The Freedom Newspaper, was seen by many as a credible and reliable source of information about the Gambia, the sort that you won't find written about on any newspaper in the country. But to those who were on the receiving end of his criticisms, he was a thorn in the flesh, an agent of the West bent on tarnishing the image of ex-president Yaya Jame and the country. Simply put, in their eyes, he was a bad son of the land. For almost a decade, he reported regularly on the Gambia. His reports included the exposing of state secrets, the disclosure of contents of cabinet meetings or their agendas, and sometimes he fray into extramarital issues which in a number of occasions led to family breakups. While he will be thanked and remembered fondly for reporting on issues Gambian would otherwise never had the chance of knowing about and for helping in the fight to bring ex-president Jame down, he also stands accused of sometimes misleading Gambians by reporting inner crises. He remains a decisive figure in death just as in life. The late journalist, broadcaster, TV and radio talk show host was born in Tuba, Muridi Kunda. Nyamina Donkunku district in the Central River region, Sierra of the Gambia. Before he started his journalism career, he worked at the then Royal Victoria Teaching Hospital, now the Edward Francis Small Teaching Hospital in Banjul, as a security guard. Reporting for I African News, I am Mariama Cham. And we continue to pray for our late colleague, Pandere Mai. May his gentle soul rest in eternal peace. Now, moving on, as the battle against Ebola continues in this African nation, Ugandan authorities are expected to receive Ebola trial vaccines as part of efforts to stem the present deadly disease. Now, the virus circulating in Uganda is the Sudan strain of Ebola. Thus, health officials remain vigilant despite the decline of cases in some areas. The WHO and the Ugandan authorities are working closely in the fight against the virus and the importation of the vaccines. Let's have more details of that in this report. The fight continues. Medical workers at this isolation center prepare themselves for the day's work. It has been close to 10 weeks of a sustained fight against Ebola. To fight Ebola is worth it and it can be won. It's also a, a time where we learn that we have, as the global health community, as Ministry of Health, as professionals, that we have to put to make sure that all the necessary capacity of health workers is there for infection prevention and control. According to health authorities, the flow of cases is slowing down. But there are worries that the current Ebola outbreak could still spread rapidly. Nine districts, including the capital, have reported cases. The potential to spread throughout the region and beyond is real and has raised concern. Knowing who has been in touch with someone who has Ebola is really key to containing it. And I think all of the regions, all of the countries in the region are concerned about the spread. Not everyone has a sophisticated health system like Uganda does. There is currently no vaccine for the Sudan strain of the virus, which is responsible for the current outbreak in Uganda. But the World Health Organization and the government of Uganda plan to test three candidate vaccines this month. We have already secured an import permit and we have been given assurance that the vaccines will be airlifted into the country, which will only take a day. The randomized trial is to evaluate potentially efficacious candidate vaccines. The trial start date is still not certain. However, health authorities are putting in place all necessary preparations once the vaccines arrive. The success of the trials will easily help control any future outbreaks of the Ebola Sudan strain. A report there is coming from the Ugandan capital, Kampala, as authorities intensify efforts to fight against the Ebola disease. 
And finally, a logistic company set up by a Nigerian woman and a mobile app has created job opportunities for hundreds of people as the industry flourishes in the West African nation. Now, the mobile app avails customers the opportunity to request for services and help boost uh, business activities within the African continent. Amid the prevailing infrastructure challenges, experts observe that Nigeria could lobby for more support to enhance the industry. And here's more details of that in this report. Elizabeth O'Malley co-runs Naira Axi, a logistics company in Abuja, Nigeria's capital. She launched the business in 2020 alongside a mobile app that allows customers to request for services. The app has garnered over 5,000 downloads, more than 7,000 deliveries, and hundreds of employees in its two years of operations. Elizabeth is now looking to scale up and cash in on the bolstering logistics markets. The Nigerian logistics sector has witnessed an upward growth defying infrastructural deficit and other bottlenecks. The industry is valued at about $60 billion. Mobile apps is one of it. Mobile app technology is a very, very key backbone of, of the logistics uh, uh, market. Um, I could also attribute it to geolocation, like the Google Maps um, and other types of maps, ability to pinpoint one particular location, and financial technology ties up everything. Experts also affirm that the African Continental Free Trade Area, AFCFTA, spurred the sector's growth. The agreement has attracted nearly $200 million worth of funding for Nigerian logistics startups in recent years. There is a trade agreement. It breaks down um, borders and um, bottlenecks that you know, hampers the movement of, um, of goods, uh, which is like logistics. It's going to really, really um, improve um, um, connectivity for us because when borders are broken down, people can now interact. Um, also, it's going to also find a way to synergize uh, most countries to ha have the same framework that can uh, prosper electronic commerce and logistics. The upswing in the Nigerian logistics sector comes amid bottlenecks, including adverse foreign investment policies, insecurity, and other infrastructural hurdles, all of which have limited exponential growth. Experts say the nation can do more to improve access to funding, scale up core technology, and broadband penetration. That inspiring report there from the Nigerian capital Abuja eventually brings us to the end of this news edition. But for more details on this and other stories, as always, as ever, you can visit on our website on iafrica.tv. But for now, though, many thanks for the pleasure of your company. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and do have a pleasant evening. Bye for now.